speaking to us this evening, I'd like to call forward and welcome to Long Beach, Frank Scatoro.
we can't even make ends meet. We have one of the highest taxes in the country. The property taxes are actually the highest. They just surpassed Westchester County. We have one of the highest sales taxes in the nation. Our state income tax is the third highest in the country. You combine that with the federal tax burden, well, that leads to this situation that we're facing today, which is an utter disaster. I remember going door to door, meeting a constituent who burst into tears as she was telling me how she could no longer hold on to the house that she had had for 40 years in New Hyde Park because it was too expensive to live here. And we're finding this time and time again. Seniors who made their lives here are not able to afford to stay. Their grandchildren are forced to leave before they even have a chance to start their careers. And those in the middle are too often caught up either in no, a situation where there's little prospect for advancement or they may find it difficult even to have a job. We have faced problems with our governing class on the federal level and on the local level. There is no reason that one of the wealthiest counties and one of the most highly taxed counties in the nation should be going broke. When you look closely at this congressional seat, you see in a county that elects predominantly Republican office holders that we have been unable to capture this seat with a candidate who was picked by the Republican bosses for 20 years. It was 20 years ago that the bosses last picked a candidate who captured this congressional seat. That's when David Levy was elected. And of course he wasn't able to hold on after being in, in there for two years because another insurgent candidate actually came and successfully primaried the organization. Well today, we face in many respects a rematch of 2010. I will tell you, the situation, the story is one that only a cynic could write and unfortunately it is, it is something peculiar to the machine-driven politics that we have in Nassau County. I did what candidates do across the country to build a campaign. I decided I love this country, it's time to step up, to make that sacrifice, to help bring our country back on track. And all I found, as I made every effort that I possibly could to put this campaign together, was that the county chairman was intent upon scuttling what I was doing. The only offense I had committed was that they did not control me. I was not beholden to them. And we know how much the bosses have driven our county government in a direction that is displayed by arrogance. We're still suffering from the arrogance of the late 1990s that put our county in a hole. The negligence, the pay-to-play uh, notion, the pay-to-play culture that has caused so many good people to to stay out of politics altogether. And he went to one elected official after the other. And to their credit, most of those that he approached said no when he tried to throw them in to make this a primary. More interested in scuttling what I was doing than in beating Carolyn McCarthy. But ultimately, he did get Fran Becker, a county legislator of seven years, to say yes. Mr. Becker has, is one of the original county legislators. He was there providing a rubber stamp for the bosses on all of the tax and spend votes that helped put this county in a hole. They may talk about the eight years spent in the wilderness when Tom Swasey was county executive, but remember how we got there. And remember that even when we, the Republicans were in the wilderness, they rubber stamped just about every union contract that came their way. And Mr. Becker still has not been a part of the solution. Well, I knew that we were in trouble in 2010 when I found that so many people who were enthused for our campaign, who had offered to help, one after the other began to tell me, you know what, Frank, I'd like to help, but I can't visibly help you. I can't sign a petition for you to get on the ballot. I can't carry a petition for you to be on the ballot. I can't appear at one of your events. Because I'm afraid I will lose a job with the county or with one of the townships if I do that. Or we even had members of the executive committee of the conservative party, people whose enthusiasm was unmistakable for my candidacy, who said that they voted against endorsing me only because they were afraid of losing their jobs. Now, how does the party of freedom 
and limited government allow a situation like this to fester. Party bosses created this system. We have many elected officials who know that it's wrong, and I'm going to be a nudge here. I'm going to press them. I'm going to work to be their conscience because they know the right thing to do. They know we can't continue this way. And you know what happened in 2010? The intimidation wasn't quite enough. We still had a lot of momentum. So what the bosses did at the last minute, they had Mr. Becker lie to the people of this county. They circulated this. This is one of three flyers that hit the voters of this district. I am a lifelong conservative Republican. Uh, this flyer here did not simply embellish, did not simply exaggerate, it lied. It said that I am a Democrat. And then it says I represent everything that is wrong with Congress. You know, people who knew me scratched their heads. What are they talking about? On primary day, vote for Fran Becker and nominate a real Republican for Congress. That's quite a statement to make from party leaders who act more like Chicago Democrats than like principled conservatives. And in a three-way primary, I fell behind. And a lot of people who looked closely at what happened in this district know that we gave this seat away. Because Carolyn McCarthy had the opportunity, following the primary, not only to outspend Mr. Becker by five and a half to one, and what do you expect when you have someone thrown in at the last minute who doesn't build a real campaign organization, but the Democratic leaders were able to tell the voters, you vote for Mr. Becker, it's like voting for Joe Mondello to be your congressman. They were able to, time and time again, distract the voters from Carolyn McCarthy's own appalling record by pointing out Mr. Becker's, Becker's record of tax increases and spending increases. You're not going to cure the problem of a congresswoman who votes 98% of the time with Nancy Pelosi, who's a rubber stamp for the Democratic leadership, with a Republican who is a rubber stamp for political bosses. And it is so glaringly obvious that ulterior motives dominate, dominate the process by which we select candidates for the nomination to Congress. Rather than be honest with you about what this election is about, and I suspect if Mr. Becker gets here, if you have a chance to talk to him, uh, you may find that he has some of the same answers that I do on some of the issues. But people who watch this closely know that if he emerges as the victor on primary day, you can look forward to two more years of a congresswoman that you rarely see who has been a rubber stamp. Because they do not want events like this. They do not want the people to pick their candidates. They do not want a group like the sponsors of this event to have any role in selecting the candidates. They want a system in which the party bosses pick the candidates and that the candidates are beholden to them because they realize that those who control the nominating process control the government and those who control the government are using it as a tool for self-enrichment. Question we have to ask is whether we're going to take this anymore or whether we're going to step up and take our country back. That's what this campaign is about. That's why I have shut my life down for several years and I've not only been able to put together a nice grassroots campaign, I've been willing to put the lion's share of my life savings into this. Some people ask me, why do you even put up with this nonsense? The answer is very simple. This is my home. And I don't want my home in the hands of people who time and time again are hurting our best interests. We can do better than bosses, than party, uh, than candidates who don't stand for fiscal responsibility, who don't stand for the true reform that we need. Not just cutting taxes and reforming our tax code, but reforming a spending process that is out of control. We're not going to fix Washington's fiscal house with someone who can't even fix Nassau County's fiscal house and who has had 17 years to do so. We're not going to combat crony capitalism in Washington with a system in our local, on the local level in which we are no, we notoriously have insiders who run the show and who are out to dole jobs and government contracts to each other. And we're not going to be able to have someone who can combat voter fraud if that candidate engages in that very activity to attain office. At the end of the day, I'm not here for those who can't tell the difference between right and wrong. As I said to you, 
People sometimes wonder why I keep talking about Grant's tomb when I talk about my background. That's where it all began. The decision that I would rather do what is right than to pursue the path of least resistance. Because if I can't come to you with my own conscience and my own soul intact, and if I can't use my own judgment, then I'm, I'm not worth listening to, I'm not worth voting for, and no amount of qualifications would ever change that. A better country and a better county begins with us. And I want to thank you with that in mind for being here with us tonight, and I would be glad to entertain your questions at the appropriate time. Now for the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes, we'll be fielding questions for uh, candidate Scatoro. Constitutional, uh, and I think it's an over expansion of Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce under the Commerce Clause. Article 1, Section 8 sets out several powers that Congress has. Among them is the power to regulate commerce among the states. We also have the Tenth Amendment that reserves to the states powers that are not reserved uh, by the to the federal government or to the people. There has never been an act of Congress that forces individual citizens to purchase a commercial product. If you want to regulate interstate commerce, there is some sort of activity that you're supposed to be regulating. And of course, that activity should have a substantial relationship to interstate commerce. Now, the Supreme Court's uh, review of this statute is going to be a close call because we have had Commerce Clause jurisprudence that has gone far in the direction of allowing Congress, of giving Congress more leeway to act. I think some of those decisions went too far. In this case, you very likely, you may be looking at a five to four decision, but whatever the decision is, I will tell you, but I have no hesitation in doing so, that if you allow this expansion of, of congressional activity, there will be no limiting principle left. And remember, our Constitution was there to give us a government of limited powers to begin with. If you don't have that limiting principle, uh, our liberties are going to be that much more jeopardized. Because, you know, a lot of people, when you talk about the Constitution, will talk, you'll think about the Bill of Rights, the individual rights that are spelled out. But federalism, the structure uh, of our state versus federal power, where the, the national blueprint fragments our power, so that's not all concentrated in the hands of one person or one entity. That's a very important part of preserving our liberty. So I will not predict how the Supreme Court will, will vote. Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic they'll do the right thing, looking at the oral arguments, but it could go either way. What I will tell you is I am committed to voting to repeal Obamacare if the Supreme Court does <laughs> And by the way, on, uh, on June 26th, which may be the very day the uh, decision will be announced, uh, we'll be right back here at the Long Beach Library with Graham Lowley, who wrote an amicus curiae brief <clears throat> that was uh, part of the Supreme Court deliberations, and Dr. John Hassett, speaking from a uh, doctor's point of view, speaking on Obamacare, uh, <clears throat> will be the topic of our next uh, Tea Party meeting. Speaking of the library, George Trapp, director of the Long Beach Library. Thank you, George. It was wonderful to move the personnel that made us uh, feel so much at home. Uh, I promise the question right here. Uh, given the uh, amount of uh, gas prices at the pump, we've seen them go from, let's say, $1.80 on average when President Obama took office to a high of about $4.15 a gallon. They've come down a little bit in the last few weeks. 
Uh, what kind of energy policy would you try to work with the Republican Party, the Tea Party establishment, to try and bring down the cost of energy prices? Thank you. You know, uh, we are one of the few nations that puts known domestic sources of oil and uh, gas uh, off limits to exploration. Um, it is really a strange situation that we're facing. And this is, I think, highlighted by uh, the hypocrisy of, of our own foreign aid policies, where, you know, we, on the one hand, basically stopped drilling off the Gulf Coast, off the coast of Louisiana, and then with our foreign aid money, we send that foreign aid to Brazil that proceeds to drill and then send oil back to us that we proceed to use. Uh, I note also that we have an energy secretary who himself saw no problem with the idea of gas prices rising to eight to nine dollars per gallon. Uh, I think that we, uh, we need to break our dependency on foreign uh, countries for oil, and that means, of course, opening up those reserves that we have. It also entails allowing, you know, we have a, a state of affairs where our oil refineries have basically been stunted, and they have not been able to, they've not been able to do their job in, in refining the, uh, the oil that we do have. We have policies like stunting the Keystone Pipeline that would create jobs uh, besides helping allies like Canada, who should be the ones who, who ship more oil than those countries that aren't very friendly to us in the Mideast. And it's, it was environmentally sensitive to do so. That's an important point to make. Uh, the president just uh, inexplicably blocked this, this uh, plan that was declared by the State Department to have been environmentally sound. Why are we blocking a drilling from Anwar? Uh, the Arctic uh, uh, Wildlife Reserves, where the, the people of Alaska are for it. Environmentally, the, the uh, effect is going to be minimal. Contrast that with the effect of, of drilling by some other countries that have absolutely no standards, no sensitivity toward the environment uh, when they drill. And by the way, they pursue policies that jeopardize our national security. So it's a win-win a to diminish regulation and to allow more exploration of oil and gas so that you will find the prices go down correspondingly, but even more importantly, there's a national security objective to be gained. Okay, next question from the rear. Yeah, uh, Frank, um, many people in the Tea Party think that a lot of what the spending that's going on in the federal government is unconstitutional, but even if you throw that away, obviously with the amount of deficit that we have, we're going to have to prioritize and at some point live within our means. So that means cutting something. Where do you start, and specifically, please? You have to start, when you're talking about a national debt approaching $16 trillion, you have to start with the principal drivers of debt. The biggest drivers, what constitutes about 70% of the federal government's mandatory spending, is our, our entitlement programs. Uh, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security are programs that are on an unsustainable path right now. It's not just a question of cutting our spending, it's also a question of these very programs' survival. We've got a, seven, a $46 trillion liability for Social Security and Medicare alone. Unfunded liabilities that are not going to be dealt with as long as you have members who, can, who kick the can down the road. Now back in the 1990s, there were principal members of both political parties, including the late Senator Moynihan on the Democratic side, who came together and said, we've got to have an honest discussion about what to do with this entitlement system. And they came up with a system that included, in the case of Medicare, premium supports, the very thing that Paul Ryan suggested. And they, they didn't demagogue it, but unfortunately, the administration in power did nothing about that. When they were pushing these reforms, they made the point that you could preserve the status quo for those who are ages 40 and over, and you would introduce mild, mild changes. I'm talking about some means testing, a modest, a slight raising of the retirement age for those who are younger, and indexing, in the case of Social Security, uh, to price inflation rather than wage inflation. And you know what happened was the can was kicked down the road, and 15 years later, we're now having the same discussion, the same debate of the most predictable crisis facing our domestic, uh, our domestic policies, and we're now saying, okay, make these reforms, you keep the status quo for those who are 55 and older, and only talk about making change for those who are younger. 
well, if we allow people like Carolyn McCarthy to continue to demagogue this issue, you can expect that we will go farther down this road, reach a point where those who are retiring, after they have already retired, will have, are having the rug pulled out from under them. Right when they, they, or they've already entered that, that phase of retirement, and it will have no one else to blame but the government, because people have seen this crisis coming for such a long time, and they don't have you know, the honesty or the character to be blunt about it with the American public. Now, when you talk about spending reform, every two years or four years, candidates for public office talk about how, oh, they'll scour our federal spending from top to bottom, waste. and they'll find places to cut, they'll find the waste, fraud, and abuse. And by the way, there is a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse that can be cut. Well, I propose that we actually do this, that we become serious about this. We can set up a de-appropriations committee a committee that actually will scour, we have appropriations committee that decide when to spend money. Well, let's set up a congressional committee that will decide where to cut money. Let's put a moratorium on earmarks that caused so many people to blame all of Congress's problems on every member except their own. Because it allows their member to say, or oh, here's some pork barrel spending that I've pushed your way. Vote, vote me in for re-election, and, and the voters will often do it, not realizing that that spending was part of a Faustian bargain with 434 other members that helped send our country off a fiscal cliff. I also think that the current system that we have uh, of debt ceiling and caps, uh, it hasn't worked out. Every time the debt ceiling uh, debate comes up, we find that our side flinches. I think you need to adopt a cut, cap, and balance approach in which we actually cap either debt or spending, to a fixed percentage of a GDP that more closely resembles our historical level of spending. And then you can, all, of course, also go to uh, individual uh, departments, individual programs uh, that could be cut or even eliminated. I think the Department of Commerce, for instance, with the exception of a couple of, uh, of functions of uh, the Census Bureau and some of the statistics that they keep, that could be phased out entirely as cabinet uh, departments go. And there are several other departments. They may not be cabinet level agencies, but we need to seriously, seriously revisit what the EPA, what the Energy uh, Department uh, uh, does, and also the Department of Education that has pushed so many unfunded mandates and shown uh, little in the sense of direction. All right, we've got time for uh, one more question. I'm sorry, uh, there will be uh, another speaker. And uh, so, uh, Jimmy, have your hand up first. Oh, thanks, Frank. Uh, Frank, I was just wondering if you could comment on the HHS mandate vis-a-vis the overall concern about that time. Yes, I think the HHS mandate, which pursuant to Obamacare, was a rule that the Obama administration adopted, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, that requires religious employers to basically provide insurance that covers various forms of contraception, and that also includes some devices that cross the line to sterilization and early abortifacients, if you look at the list of devices. It actually forces a good number of religious employers to provide these, uh, these measures to their employees, in many cases, against their conscience. There is a narrowly uh, defined religious employer exception that applies only to churches uh, and to have the houses of worship within their walls, but it doesn't apply more broadly to the charitable institutions, the schools, the hospitals, Catholic charities, for instance, one of the largest charitable enterprises in the world. You have there aspects of religious activity. This is one of the things that the administration doesn't get. Religion is more about is about more than the worship that occurs within the walls of a house of worship, as critical as that is. It also entails giving food to the hungry, giving, giving aid to those uh, who need medical services. And there's, of course, a great risk that those services will be shut down if you put people and you put institutions in a position where they have to violate their conscience or violate uh, or, or, or you know, deny these uh, services altogether. I think that the mandate is a violation of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that Congress passed about 20 years ago. And I think for that reason, the mandate should be struck down by the courts. If it's not, I will certainly uh, vote to repeal it, along with uh, the best, the rest of, uh, of Obamacare. Well, thank you so much, friends. Enjoy. Enjoy the rest of the way.
Our other candidate uh, is not here yet, he won't be here shortly. 